here we go. We'll begin with our little introduction that I sometimes remember to uh, add. Uh, when the great Rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tov saw misfortune threatening the Jews, it was his custom to go into a certain part of the forest to meditate. There he would light a fire, say a special prayer, and the miracle would be accomplished and the misfortune averted. Later, when his disciple, the celebrated Magid of Mizrich, had occasion for the same reason to intercede with heaven, he would go to the same place in the forest and say, Master of the universe, listen, I do not know how to light the fire, but I'm still able to say the prayer. And again, the miracle would be accomplished. Still later, Rabbi Moshe Leib of Sasov, in order to save the people once more, would go into the forest and say, I do not know how to light the fire. I do not know the prayer, but I know the place and this must be sufficient. And it was sufficient and the miracle was accomplished. Then fell to Rabbi Israel of Rijin to overcome misfortune. Sitting in his armchair, his head in his hands, he spoke to God. I'm unable to light the fire and I do not know the prayer I cannot even find the place in the forest. All I can do is tell the story. And this must be sufficient. And it was sufficient. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to um, share my screen so that we can uh, see this story. One second. Okay, and here we go. This story is called Mazel's Day. And uh, okay, I don't know what's going on. One waiting. Hold on. Where is the waiting? So where's the person who's waiting? Where's the waiting? Where's the waiting here? Maybe they gave up. There. No, it's a, the, the glitch in this, whatever it is. Okay, good. Um, by a uh, writer, Gloria Goldreich. I don't know if anybody's familiar with her. I am not familiar with her, but she's actually a, a known writer who's published some popular uh, uh, writings, and um, this is, uh, she wrote a lot of novels, and this is a short story of her, of hers. Uh, it's contemporary, it's a, well, it's about 20 years old or something like that. Um, okay, so the, uh, hold on one more second, please. Okay. Um, Can we please get out of here? Okay. Um, okay, who would like to uh, do us the uh, favor of, of reading for us? <clears throat> Who's gonna do this? I'll do it. <laughs> okay, Rhonda, thank you. Okay, sure. Mazel huddles into her oversized hooded plaid coat as she waits for the light to change. It is only late October, but already she can feel the chill of impending winter. Although she has lived in New York for two years, Mazel still thinks of autumn as an alien season. In Israel at summer's end, thin sea leaves scatter briefly and cypresses sway mournfully in the sea scented breeze, a peaceful transition from one season to another. <clears throat> Keep going? Yeah, you, you're, you're on, this is it, okay. you're, you're stuck. Oh. Okay, Mazel knows Israelis who marvel at the fall foliage. Her neighbor, Nahama, who like Mazel is the paid companion of an elderly Jewish woman, gave her a basket of small misshapen gourds in muted shades of russet and orange, purchased during a weekend trip to Vermont. Mazel thinks the gourds ugly, but she does not want to offend Nahama, who is always welcoming always ready to share her copy of Ma'ariv, 
always ready to discuss the bad news from Israel. Ma'ariv is a popular paper in Israel. Yeah. <clears throat> the, light the light changes and Mazel crosses the wide avenue and enters the Tiberius Gardens where the walls are pasted with faded posters. A view of the Western Wall, a nightscape of Tel Aviv, anemones on a Galilee meadow. Two men sip small cups of muddy Turkish coffee at a table covered with a white paper cloth. They argue vigorously in Hebrew, their voices drowning out of Chava Alberstein's wistful voice singing of starry Negev nights. Mazel hums along as she studies the Hebrew English menu. Fat Yoram, the owner, is on the phone. He shouts at the suppliers in Arabic, makes another call and shouts again in Hebrew hangs up and okay that's good okay he smiles at mazel reminding her of her ex-husband chaim who is always swiftly angered and swiftly smooth it is a way of Morocco. someone's coming on yeah so it okay it, it is the way of moroccan men chaim's mother had once told her an explanation which had irritated Mazel. So, Mazel, how are you, Yoram asks. Too cold today, this country, this weather. Yoram has lived in Brooklyn for seven years, but he is still ambushed by autumn. Mazel shrugs and orders Turkish salad, stewed okra, and tomatoes. As Yoram fills the white cardboard containers, Mazel inhales the mingled scents of his spices and thinks of the spinach and rice patties that had cooked in the iron skillet she had carried with her from Sana and the fragrant lamb stews that had simmered on her stove. Mazel cannot cook such foods on the hot plate in her sliver of a kitchen. And the one time she made a lentil dish in Mrs. Klein's kitchen, the old woman had complained to her daughter, Paula, who had tried to be conciliatory. I'm sorry, Mazel, Howard and I both love Middle Eastern cooking, but the odor gives my mother a headache. You understand, eat anything in the refrigerator. Mazel had nodded, although she did not believe that Paula and her husband have any fondness for the spicy food she craves. They are both tall and thin, Howard a pathologist and Paula a psychiatrist. Mazel thinks that the acrid scent of death and misery clings to them. Mazel seldom eats Mrs. Klein's food. She is repelled by the soft, bland white cheeses, the gray meat, pale chicken, and jelly broth, the pureed vegetables, and ominously dark compotes. These foods are prepared by Lucy, the younger daughter, who drives in from Great Neck once a week, laden with shopping bags. Lucy also buys her mother soft pastel-colored sweaters and long sleeve silk blouses that conceal the wrinkled flesh that hangs so loosely from the aged arms. The gifts are grudgingly accepted, the clothing tried on only after Lucy leaves. The previous week, Lucy had brought a pink Angora sweater and both mother and daughter had pressed Mazel for reaction. Did she like the color, the cut of the neck? Pink is beautiful, beautiful, Mazel had said. My favorite color. My daughter's too. Dark-haired Lucy, who is divorced and teaches anthropology at a community college, favors long, loose dresses of rough weaves and heavy pendants of geometric design. Miss Klein speaks bitterly of Lucy's ex-husband, a non-Jewish professor of philosophy who never earned tenure. They had never trusted him, never liked him. Mazel's family, in contrast, had liked Chaim, who was a skilled welder, a steady earner, a Moroccan who had accepted the customs of the Yemenites with ease. Mazel's decision to divorce had bewildered. Her explanations had angered. So he had a temper. All men had tempers. Look at the apartment he had given her, the good life but it's not the life I want. I want to see something of the world, to go to America. I want something different. She had choked on the exclamation.
exculpation of her own yearnings gagged on her guilt and mercy. Her mother wept, her father shouted, what will you have in that America? Who will understand you there? You'll lay there like a dog, alone. There, there are nights when Mazel sits in her rented room and thinks that her father, who had understood so little, had in fact understood everything. Occasionally, Lucy brings her children to visit their grandmother. They are twins, wild and noisy, unlike Paula's gentle, dreamy daughter, a student at New England College. Cindy writes to her grandmother on oddly textured notepaper, asking questions about her life. Mazo laboriously reads these notes aloud because the old woman's eyes are so weak, thinks of her own grandmother, a wizened gnome of a woman, her dark leathery skin stretched tight against her avian face, her cold dark eyes bright with mysterious memories. She had sat day after day at the window. The children of Rosh Ha'ain had waved to her as they scurried past the house. No one in Flatbush, where the curtains are drawn and the doors are double locked, waved to Mrs. Klein. In this America, Mazel thinks, the old people drown in their loneliness. And not only the old, the memory of her own nocturnal misery sours her mouth. <clears throat> You heard the news this morning, Mazel, the suicide bomber in Holon, three dead, school children. Yoram sighs and Mazel shakes her head sadly. She and Yoram share the cryptic code of the exile with a single focus. The only news of any interest to them emanates from Israel. The death of a child, the wounding of a soldier, paralyzes them with misery. What does your daughter think will happen? Yo Yoram is impressed that Yael works for military intelligence. He does not know that she is only a typist and that her infrequent letters are largely requests for compact disks and genes, always ending with the same plaintive question. Ima, when are you coming home? Mazel never answers that question. When she was Yael's age, 20, she was already a mother. Yael should understand that she must save enough to buy herself a flat, furniture, appliances. You know that my daughter cannot write about her work, Mazel says curtly. Of course, Yoram is apologetic. He wraps a potato barica and adds it to her purchases. No charge. He gives her a tattered copy of last month's Haisha. Haisha, Mazel, the magazine like uh, like a ladies' home journal used to be, or something like that. Okay. Mazel pays him, counting out the bills carefully and with pleasure. Each Friday, when Paula hands her the six fifty dollar bills, she riffles through the currency, enjoying the feel, enjoying the feel of the money she has earned that belongs to her alone. It vests her with power and independence. She drops a coin in the Bobby Salah canister, another in the mug and David Adom box. The Bobby so, Salah is, a, is a, uh, uh, an old, now he's no longer alive, um, an old holy man who was uh, revered by the uh, Mizrahi Jews, by the Jews oh. uh, from uh, Northern uh, uh, um, uh, Africa, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, his uh, his grave is somewhere outside of Beersheba, and it's mm -hmm. a holy site. I forgot okay. it's in some town. I forgot which town it's in, but uh, it's a it's a pilgrimage site that people go to. He's considered like a saint. Okay, I went there. You went there. I went there last year. Everybody. Oh, you remember which town it is? I forgot. It was outside of Beersheba. We were in Beersheba. And everybody was talking about this thing. I had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> These were all people that lived in the Moshav that I was staying in that week. And yeah, we went there. We went there at like, I think you know, Ofakim. Midnight. It might be Ofakim. It might be yeah, Ofakim. Ofakim is one of the places that we stayed. Right. Hold on a second, please. Sure.
Hello. Hello. Okay, good. Here we go. Continue. Yeah. Um, okay. Shalom. I think also on. one more. I think it's called actually. I think there's a typo. I think it's the Baba Sally, not the Bobby Sally. Oh. But okay. the, now it's clear, right? Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Shalom, Yaram. Shalom, Uvaracha Mazel. The quiet blessing of farewell trails her onto Ocean Avenue. Hurrying now, she turns the corner and lets herself into the house just as the phone begins to ring. Mazel knows that it is Paula calling to make sure that she arrived on time and the daily monitoring angers her. There's an edge to her voice as she talks to Paula. Your mama is fine, she says. You'll be here today? Paula visits each Tuesday and Friday afternoon and occasionally Lucy arranges to meet her sister. Always then they urge Mazel to take a few hours off and Mazel knows that they want to discuss their mother's finances to arrange the transfer of funds from one account to another to check her silver, her jewelry. They are after all, the conservatories of her possessions, but their vigilance offends Mazel. When she returns, they stop talking and then chatter with nervous rapidity, complimenting her on how orderly she keeps the house before they broach their mother's small complaints. The dishes are not always properly dried. The light is too often left on in the kitchen. Mazel always listens sullenly and reminds them that their mother calls to her from the bedroom when she is in the midst of a kitchen chore. Paula and Lucy nod sympathetically. They know that Mazel works hard and they wish they could spend more time with their mother, but they are so busy. What more could they do? Hmm. Mazel does not tell them how her grandmother's children came each day to the Rosha Ayin house carrying dishes of food and freshly laundered clothing and linens. They hovered over the old woman telling stories, singing the songs of Yemen, a frail sweet chorus, their voices wafting through the windows so that passersby stopped to listen. Who sings like this in America? Who takes care of an old mother? Yes, I'll be there this afternoon. Paula's voice is irritable. Mazel, I'm waiting for you, Mrs. Klein whines from the bedroom. Mazel replaces the receiver and hangs her coat up, pausing in the living room to push the royal blue ottoman closer to the armchair. She dusts the low table with her handkerchief because Paula sometimes runs her finger across it. In the bedroom, the old woman sits forlornly at the edge of her unmade bed, running a hairbrush through her thinning snow white hair. She is dressed, but her striped silk blouse is incorrectly buttoned and her navy skirt is unzipped. Here, Mama, let me help you. Mazo thinks of Mrs. Klein as Hoskina, the old woman, but she calls her Mama because that pleases Paula and Lucy, helps them to think of Mazo as a relative rather than a servant. That is perhaps why they hired a Jewish woman. Mazo corrects the buttons zips up her skirt and kneels to lace the clumsy black space shoes. She notices that the bureau drawer in which the old woman keeps her favorite possessions is open. It's content, contents in wild disarray. Mild, mild, not wild. Oh, oh mild, sorry. Don't get too dramatic. <laughs> Don't get too dramatic. <laughs> you want something from the drawer, she asked? No, last night I was looking for something but now I don't want it. Mazel is not surprised. Her employer often rearranges her small treasures, sometimes showing them to Mazel. Scarves and sweaters, a cameo, a gold lapel watch, a gray cashmere sweater with a collar of soft gray fur. She shrugs. In the kitchen, she prepares the old woman's breakfast, counts out her gem colored pills, which the old woman swallows one at a time, waiting expectantly after each sip of juice as though anticipating an infusion of energy. Mazel settles her in the blue chair and turns the television set on. She
She makes the bed, clears the breakfast dishes, and returns to watch a talk show about very fat men married to thin women. <laughs> Stupid, her employer says, and she nods in agreement. In Israel, we don't have such shows. Her tone is disapproving. So you should go back to Israel. The sly malice of the rejoinder wounds Mazel, who returns to the bedroom and reads Haisha, emerging only when it is time to prepare lunch. She punishes the old woman with solitude. After lunch, it is time for a nap. Mazel settles her on the bed, covers her with a duvet, and lingers at the bureau, straightening the comb and the brush, the small blue bottle of toilet water. What are you doing, Mazel? The question asked in such a sharp tone startles Mazel, who had thought Mrs. Klein was asleep. Nothing, she replies defensively, just making a little order. In the kitchen, she spooned some of the turkey salad onto a pizza. She will take the rest of it home and invite Nakama to eat with her. The anticipation of a shared meal and Hebrew conversation lightens her mood. She's still nibbling at the pita when the front door opens and Lucy calls to her from the doorway. It's only me, Mazel. I'm early today. Lucy hangs up her russet colored cape and drapes her batik scarf over her white wool sweater. She comes into the kitchen. You want I should make you coffee? Mazel asks. Now I'll wait for Paula. Mazel continues to eat, but all pleasure is gone. Lucy wanders restlessly from room to room as she often does, sometimes picking up an album of old photos, sometimes rearranging the framed portraits in the living room. Paula and herself as children, their, ch their children as toddlers. Her parents as newlyweds. Mazel thinks of her parents' home where there are pictures of herself as a baby, a slender schoolgirl, a bride, photos that anchor her serving as a ballast. Here, no one knows that she is the daughter of Boaz, the spice vendor, granddaughter of Shalom, the silversmith. Lucy opens the china closet, studies the silver chest. Mazel hears the cabinet doors open and close as she continues to read her magazine. She barely looks up as Paula enters the house, striding into the kitchen, still wearing her tanned coat, which only emphasizes her pallor. Briefly, Mazel pities her. Hi, Mazel, how are you? But Paula does not wait for an answer. It is understood that she does not care how Mazel is. Lucy comes into the room and Paula gives her a peremptory kiss. They turn to Mazel. Why don't you go out, Mazel? Have some time for yourself. Lucy and I will be here when Mama wakes up, Paul suggests, but Mazel knows that it is, in fact, an order. All right, why not? It is, after all, only right that they should be there while their mother sleeps. They, the daughters, Mazel's mother and her aunts always sat beside her grandmother's bed as the old woman napped, loving vigilantes on guard against the angel of death. We're sure, we don't mind, Paula replies impatiently. Mazel takes the bus to the King's Plaza Mall where she wanders aimlessly. Shops do not interest her today. She wishes she had a friend who would meet her for coffee, a friend with whom she could share her contempt for the cheap merchandise, the careless and attentive mothers. She walks slowly, hobbled by her loneliness. She leaves the mall and goes into a luncheonette owned by a large bellied and balding Israeli named Moshe, where she orders a Turkish coffee. You're slow today. She is alone at the counter and the tables are empty. It's always slow after lunch. I can't complain. One year more, maybe two, and I'll have enough money to go to Israel to start my own business in Halon. War or peace, people need sinks, toilets. Better to buy a shop. That sells bulletproof vests, she says bitterly. She picks up a copy of Mariv on the counter and reads an advertisement for a new housing complex in Batyam. The street name is unfamiliar, and she wonders if she will recognize her own country when she returns. 
or will she wander the streets of Tel Aviv, uncertain and alone? She finishes her coffee, and she and Moshe discuss Sharon's most recent speech until Moshe is called away by the entrance of a group of old ladies. Disappointed, she leaves, and because she can think of nothing else to do, she boards the bus and returns to the house. Perhaps they will be pleased that she returned early. She opens the door with her key and closes it very quietly, fearful of disturbing the old woman's nap. But there is no need for such caution. The three women are in the bedroom and Mrs. Klein's voice is fearful, insistent. I know exactly where I put it. You girls think I can't remember where I put things? The sweater's not in the drawer. You looked yourselves. Did you find it? We're not arguing with you. We know it's not there. Paula speaks to her mother with a professional calm that may reassure her patients. What do you think, Lucy? I saw Mama put it in that drawer myself, and no one comes into this room except, except Mago. But it doesn't make sense that she would take something after all these months, something that isn't even valuable. Maybe she thought that if it wasn't valuable, we wouldn't notice. And she did like that sweater. She even said that pink was her favorite color. Paula appraises the situation with diagnostic reason. Margaret's cheeks burn. Her heart pounds. She strides into the bedroom. They stare at her, their faces very pale. You look for something and didn't find it, she shrills. Paula places her hand protectively on her mother's shoulder. We can't find my mother's new pink sweater. Maka opens the bottom drawer and takes out the sweater. I put it there so it shouldn't get creased. I take care of your mother's things like they were my own. Maka, we're sorry, but Mama was so upset. Lucy stumbles over her words, blushes deeply, but Paula's skin remains waxen. Maka glares at them. Calm deserts her. The simmering fury of months boils over into a roiling rage. They do not trust her. Paula with her morning checkup calls, Lucy always looking into closets and cabinets. Chutzpah. She tosses the sweater onto the bed. You didn't want her to be upset, she mimics Lucy's voice. Such good daughters. So good that you pay me to do, take care of her, even though you worry that maybe I steal from her. Such good daughters that would leave your mother maybe with a thief. In my family, this would not happen. We took care of our own. My grandmother's children came to her every day and her grandchildren too. They came from the army, from their schools. They kissed her hands. They asked her to bless them. Me, I cut her nails, her fingernails, her toenails. Like I cut your mother's. I take care of your mother like she was my own. Ask her. Ask her. The old woman shakes her head. You do, Mazel. Of course you do. Tears streak her wrinkled cheeks. Why would I take such a sweater? My daughter, Maya El, she is young, beautiful. She wants a sweater. I buy it for her. That's why I work here. That's why I take money to do what daughters should be doing. Paula and Lucy lower their eyes like chastened children. It was just a misunderstanding, Paula says. No, it was an insult. Mazel spits the word out and leaves the room. She takes her cardigan and her sneakers from the hall closet, shoves them into a plastic bag, and adds the white cardboard containers of food from Yoram's Yer restaurant. Lucy and Paula race after her, confront her as she struggles into her plaid coat. Mazel, what are you doing? Paula asks. You can see. I'm leaving. I don't work where I'm not trusted. You owe me for two days this week, $100. Mazel, please don't leave. We want you to stay. We made a mistake. Please come into the living room. We'll talk about it, Paula says coaxingly. Mazel looks at the sisters and sees the fear and regret in their eyes. Energized by a new sense of power, she sits on the royal blue chair, still gripping her plastic shopping bag. The tall sisters... Penitent supplicants stand before her. Look, we made a mistake. And you said some unkind things, but now it's over. Mama likes you and she really wants you to be here. 
We thought we would raise your pay at Hanukkah. But why should we wait for December? We'll give you a raise now, Paula says. And Lucy nods vigorously. How you doing, Rhonda? You all yeah. right? Yeah, well, I'm fine. <laughs> it's not the money, Model insists. If I stay, it's because of how I feel about your mother. But it's a hard job. And it's hard to get here from where I live. Two different buses. Where my friend Nakama works, the family pays her car fare. The sisters look knowingly at each other. All right, we'll pay your car fare, Lucy agrees. Mazel, the old woman calls, I want my tea. Mazel goes into the kitchen and makes the tea, draping her coat over a chair. All right, she calls as the kettle boils. I stay because she needs me. When she carries the tray in, the old woman is sitting up in bed holding the gray sweater with the fur collar. She gives the sweater to Mazel. For you, she says, and lifts the cup. Mazel's fingers dance across the soft wool, the silvery fur. I don't need such a sweater, but I want you to have it. She takes a sip of tea. It's good, this tea. I made it with honey. Mazel presses the fur against her cheek and carefully folds the sweater. Take it, Mazel, Lucy says softly. She and Paula prepare to leave. They refresh their lipstick and each in turn kisses her cheek. Dustings of her pale face powder cling to their newly painted lips. Goodbye, Mazel, they say in unison, but they do not meet her eyes. The door slams behind them and Mazel turns on the television set. She and Mrs. Klein watch a talk show on which an estranged mother and daughter are reconciled and hug each other. Mazel remembers her mother's embrace, imagines herself putting her arms about Yael. Tears sear her cheeks and she hurries to prepare the old woman's dinner, staring from the kitchen window into the neighboring house. A man still in his overcoat kisses his wife. A woman sits at a table and helps children with their homework. Mazel peels a carrot a cucumber. The old woman eats quickly and Mazel clears up with matching swiftness. They are both glad to have this day end. You took the sweater, Mazel? I have it, Mazel assures her. Thank you, she adds hesitantly and hurries out. The night is cold and the tense early darkness of autumn depresses her. Arriving home, she is relieved to see a light in the Hama's window. She is not yet ready to face the silence of her own room. The friends eat together, and Mazel shows Nakama the sweater. It's beautiful, Nakama says, a good color for you. Where would I wear it? Mazel asks bitterly. The evenings of her life in this land that is not her own stretch before her, a barren desert of time. That night she showers, using the ahava soap that she hoards for time of need. She stands for a long time beneath the hot spray. She would wash away all the sadness of the day, the small and bitter betrayals, the solitude that trails her like a shadow, the rustling of brittle leaves driven by a vagrant wind. She puts on a fresh nightgown of white cotton and over it the soft gray sweater. Her long black hair, Damp from the shower, capes the silvery fur. She sniffs her fingers, that smell of Israel. Still wearing the sweater, she lies very still on her narrow bed. A car alarm shrills on the street below, and a child's laughter, high and sweet, sounds in the hallway. At last, her hand upon the fur, Mazel sleeps. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so that's the story. <laughs> so uh, any uh, comments, any uh, you know, reactions? Anybody want to say a word or two? Go ahead, Josie. Uh, yep. I, I think uh, the writer conveys very well the loneliness of someone growing older who doesn't have much of a life. Uh, in her own little world. And I think she does it gently and with love. 
because I recognize some things in there. Mm. There's a lot of little details, right? A lot of tiny touches mm -hmm. that just get interspersed in the story uh, as it as it goes along that make you sort of like really feel that you're there a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about what about why why is Mazel in this situation, Carol? Well, she's tr she's trying to earn money. And there aren't very many ways that, you know, uh, people, I'll, I'll use the word immigrants or unskilled, uh, unskilled people can, can earn money. And it, it was a way of her helping somebody. And it's the area in which she was from, uh, she was from and what, and what she knew. And what she knew also was how she, she sat around at, uh, her, what her family did for her grandmother. Mm -hmm. And, and, it, and it's interesting because there, there, there's a school of thought where um, children will put their parents, parent, uh, surviving parent in a nursing home and others will keep them home. I had that on my father's side of the family. And you don't know what to do. And some people keep, uh, keep uh, elderly relatives who need help at home or, they, or, or there's a nursing home or whatever. So it's, you have to figure out what's, what's the best way for the family. And this is what they thought of. But I know of cases, I, I know that when you have hired help mm -hmm. caregivers, that people are concerned about their valuables. Yeah. So, right, so I also, a, a major yeah. part of the story here mm -hmm. is this situation uh, between the, the daughters and uh, Mrs. Klein. Yeah. Yeah, Rhonda. I was just going to say that uh, Mazel uh, re I, she really misses Israel and taking care of Mrs. Klein reminds her a little bit of home because it was what she did when she was home, you know, caring for somebody and the right. fact that it's a, it's a, some place for her to put her love really. So, so I'm going to come back to my question. So what is Mazel? She needs to, she wants to earn money. Of course she has mm -hmm. to earn money. But what is she doing there? How did she find herself in this situation? Well, I imagine she didn't come to America with much money. Why did she come to America? Well, she divorced her husband. Why did she divorce her husband? He wasn't a nice guy. That's not what the family thought. No, no. Oh, yeah. She, you know, know what, what, the wife, what the wife thinks and what the rest of the family thinks are can be completely different diametrically opposed opinions. Didn't she say something like he didn't listen when she spoke? Or? Yeah, there's, there's uh, I mean, that's part of the subtext of this, uh, the, the theme of this story also is everybody with their own perceptions mm -hmm. and everybody with their own uh, needs. Um, what I got from the story uh, was that, you know, she here she has a, a we know she has this 20 year old daughter. Mm -hmm. And the decision to leave is her decision, right? The family is shocked or against this right. whole idea. And she's getting rid of her husband. And they ask her why. And she says, I want something else. Mm -hmm. I want something better. I, I, I don't want what, what this is. And they go, he gives you a good life. He provides for you. He's fine. So what if he gets angry every once in a while? That's the way men are. You know, there's this whole, you know, sense of... Uh, know of uh, uh, cultural things and mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, gender stuff mm -hmm. but uh, she had some kind of yearning right she has some kind of dream and that's part of where our story brings us is a person whose dreams are not being fulfilled right, right. because it sounds like she, in retrospect she was probably happier in Israel than she is here in the United States Right, she's she doesn't, you know that that the thought of Israel keeps coming back mm -hmm. because uh, you know there's no place like home, right? Um, mm -hmm. And home, of course, is is the is a big question um, in 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 the story. Um, so, who el who else has has questions about home in the story? In the story, um, there are these minor characters. Yoram, maybe. Yeah. Right, so Yoram, yeah. Yoram is is the Israeli, mm -hmm. uh, you know, restaurant. It's not even a restaurant. I wouldn't call it a restaurant. What would we call it? You know, some uh, bodega. <laughs> a bodega, greasy spoon, an Israeli greasy spoon 
place. So she goes there. And then later on, when she's in the mall, she mm. goes into another Israeli, you know, eatery. Oh, sure. So because she's in she's in uh, that part of Brooklyn, you know, which is a very Jewish area. Right. And it's got um, subtly, this is described, right? You've got Mrs. Klein and her people. And then you've got this whole Israeli expat um, mm. uh, community, right? And uh, those are the people she actually can talk to, uh -huh. right? Those are the people, even though they're not family, but in some sense they are family because they all have the same sense of dislocation. They all mm -hmm. have the same sense of that uh, that that connection that that you know to that missing place, um, and uh, and we get this these this motif also of the Hebrew media, right? The Hebrew paper, mm, right. right? We've got the newspaper, we've got the magazine, and that's part of what actually dates this story, uh. right? Because nowadays it's all online. Mm. Everything is. Uh, I mean, you you know, you're going to see it if you go into an, an again an Israeli eatery. You might you might see mostly you'd see Israel Shalanu these days, which is the the BB uh, wow. rag that Adelson uh, pays for. Um, wow. But uh, but um, you know, there's there's this point in time that is that is that is focused in this story, where that they're holding on to these little things, right? They're holding on to these 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 uh, imported um you know magazines and newspapers but it's over there you know and, and one of oh, them okay. says he's going to come back right one of them says in another year or two i'll have enough money right. right and i'll be able to get back there but she pushes it off right her reaction is yeah yeah right right, right. yeah right right yeah go 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 get shot over there you know uh, right start it yeah, right yeah right by right? bullet so, so, yeah. so does she does she really think that she's going to be able to go home no, I don't think so. Yeah, Josie. There's also the whole cultural difference between an American Jewish family mm -hmm. and the way she remembers family in Israel. The two daughters are American women whose idea of doing the right thing is find someone to take care of our aged mother, whereas... Why can't they do it themselves? Well, they have to work. But that's not what people do here. <laughs> it's a full-time job. So, so both, I mean, both of those things, that's not what people do. Yeah. And also they've got their own lives, right? They've got professions. Right. You know, one of them is as, a, as, a, as a, a kid, one of them is divorced, but they all, but they both of them have a career, right? Which Mazel does not have. That's right. right? Well, they, it, I mean, maybe they need now, the maybe money. Things maybe they changed. work because they need money, but. We all need money for sure. I'm not saying no. I'm not saying no. Are things changing in Israel or does does that whole sense of your family is your responsibility still endure today? Because mm -hmm. Israel is a very modern country. Yeah, I, 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 it's a good question. Um, Israel, I mean, the story puts up this very stark contrast. Right? In Mazel's mind, look at a difference of how one family mm -hmm. takes care of its own my family in Israel, and look at the difference over here with the daughters. So, so she's, you know, working with this very, very big, you know, black and white difference. And it's an extended family and generation after generation, the grandchildren are coming in to kiss grandma's hands mm -hmm. and so on. You know, there's, there's a, a sense of respect and, and appreciation. Um, I think that, that that kind of sense is still left over to a great degree, but uh, but it, I think it's fading. It's just that it's it's got a lot more in the bank that it can, mm. you know, it's like when you have a million dollars in the bank and you keep spending it, it'll just take you a lot, a, a lot longer to spend it than if you only got a hundred dollars in the bank. So um, now they had, I think, a quite a strong sense. And uh, again, they were immigrants into Israel, remember? That's, that's the whole point, they were Yemenites. And they came to Israel. They were airlifted into Israel. Israel was mm -hmm. the dream come true for the Jews of Yemen. <laughs> she talks about their traditional, um, you know, uh, 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 trades. Being a silversmith, that was like a famous mm -hmm. thing. That the Yemenites were the best silversmiths in the world. And then spices, you know, being being experts on spice uh, uh, stuff, that was very traditional. Um, 
And what you get in, in, uh, in the American scene is not, you know, yes, they've got this sense of, hey, this is my mother. I got to make sure that she's taken care of. Uh, she's not in, a, in, in some, you know, old age home yet. Um, but there isn't, is there any reference to any Jewish um, element in, the, in their lives? Um, Mrs. Klein's no. daughters, no. Hmm. Right, it doesn't, there's not a single reference to that. It's, hmm. it's the American TV. Right. And it's the fact that they have very good professions. So that's mm -hmm. the American Jewish story. The other but, thing, I think that, I mean, a lot of, you know, grown children, you know, they talk to their parents once a week or something. These girls, these women drop by every day. So in their mind- Twice a week, twice a week. They, oh, I thought, it, okay. Don't but, exaggerate. <laughs> I'm sorry, but in No, 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 mind, but you're right. They, twice a week is amazing. They, Actually- they probably but, thought they were being, you know, wonderful. And so relatively, everything is relative. So yes, absolutely. Yeah. They they were they were knocking themselves out in a real mm -hmm. in a real serious way. Uh -huh. And let's go back to Mazel for a second. She idealizes this image of her family and how everybody uh -huh. sticks close to her family. Is that what she did? No, mm -hmm. she left Israel. She's the one who left. <laughs> She's the one who who abandons the family. She abandons her, her parents. She abandons her daughter. Mm, right. Right, so she's got this dream. She needs to find some meaning in life, some relevance for herself, and uh, and yet all of her vocabulary comes from a different way of thinking about things. Mm -hmm. Right, she's got a, she's got a whole, you know, baggage, a trunk full of associations and memories and values, and she carries it with her, but she leaves with it. Right, she's not. Uh, she's not gonna. She's she's not living it out in that kind of like fairy tale way at all. She might if also you, be looking at it through the past through rose colored glasses. Maybe she doesn't remember that you know the grandchildren were complaining. Why do I have to kiss this woman's hand and that kind of right, stuff? Right. So, what did she think about her own father? There was a line in there. Oh, I can't remember. There's a line in there where she goes, as she's looking back, she goes, my father or her father, you know, whatever the, the, the narrator, right. who, never, who was, never understood anything, all of a sudden now she thinks maybe he really understood everything. Right, right, right. Right, so when, when she was there, he was this guy who didn't get it. He didn't, he didn't understand what she was about. He didn't understand what was important to her, what she had to do. He was clueless. Now she's wondering, maybe maybe he actually really saw all too well. Yeah, Carol. Well, isn't it universal that as you're growing up and everything, you, you, you don't think uh, your parents are that smart and everything, but as you get older and you learn and you think mm -hmm. back, all of a sudden you realize how smart and intelligent and understanding parents were, but as you were growing up, you didn't. I, right, I think it was uh, Mark Twain who made the joke that, you know, when he was, I forgot, you know, when, when he was like 15, he thought his father was an idiot. And then when he was 20, he was amazed at how much his father learned in five years. <laughs> right? so, uh, so yes, that, that's a universal, uh, you know, growing up uh, syndrome. Mm -hmm. but, I so, but I think this, this story can be, I mean, the fact that it's, uh, has, uh, uh, Mazel came from Israel and the uh, Israelis in li living in Brooklyn and everything. But you can almost say it for any ethnic group in a different, in a different country, because as you were talking about why she came, uh, why she came to uh, left Israel, people came to, came to the United, came to America because they thought that the uh, streets were paved with gold and they could make money and then go back. And then- mm. and, for, and right for, before they came, they those those the people in the deep state took all the gold off the streets. Uh, they're hiding it, you know, and, and until after we leave, and then they're going to put it back out there again. I know, I know that for a fact. So uh, yeah, some people think that about the Jews that we took all. Right, that's right. That's right. One, that's right. one thing I found very interesting about the story, and uh, the minute I heard Great Neck, my, my mind went to well, what, where in Great Neck does this daughter live? Because mm -hmm. it, it wasn't far from where I grew up. Right. Well, Great Neck is Jewish success land. It's like living. Yes. Space. 
Yeah. Great Neck is definitely Jewish. I mean, it was when I grew up. Grew up. I mean, was it still that way when you were in uh, New York? Yeah, yeah, it's still that way to this very day. Okay. Mm -hmm. still that way to, to this very moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so talk about dreams and reality or the difference between our images and our hopes or our expectations and then what actually turns out. There's also a nice little touch. It's a sad touch. What about Mazel's daughter? What do we know about Mazel's daughter? Mm. Uh, she has a job for uh, at a, something having to do with national security and Mazel makes believe that she's like a spy or something, but she's really a clerk. Right, right. I mean, that's, could, that is like the pinnacle of the, you know, of the Israeli hierarchy. This is a, mm -hmm. my daughter is in military mm -hmm. intelligence. She is saving the entire country. She is, you know, the creme de la creme. Actually, she's a secretary, mm -hmm. you know, typing, you know, in the office, you know, and so this, again, it's this like, this, 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 you know, this high, beautiful, imaginative world of, of uh, success and of value and of goodness. And then there's the, the you know, the, the rinky dink kind of reality mm. that, uh, that the people uh, are, are inhabiting here. Yeah. Josie, yeah. yeah. Well, she has to have something. And a lot of people make up a fantasy story that they tell themselves to get through it. Well, here mm. she's not making it up for herself. She, she just telling? uses it for the, other, for the other guy. Like when, when Yoram or whatever, now she's not going to tell the yeah. restaurant guy, the the you know the eatery guy. No, my daughter is really just a, a you know a, a typist. She's going to say, you know, I can't tell you what she's doing. This is a secret, you know. So, <laughs> so, so she's you know she she's presenting to him. She's using that that image, that fantasy, to preserve a little sense of dignity for herself, mm. even though mm. you know. That that isn't the case, but but that's what uh, that's what she needs. Yeah, mm -hmm. David. As it turns out, I have a, a niece by the name of Yael, uh -huh. who was um, yeah popular in, name in, in security, um, <laughs> military what does she security. Do? Huh? What does she do? Well, I, I'm about to tell you. She can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a secret. And and she married uh, a fellow that she met who was also in in security in the Israeli army. And um, when um, when they came to, to America before they got married, when they came to America, she came to my mother's house to introduce her uh, fiance. And um, and we're sitting around my mother's living room and, and I was just a real wise guy. <laughs> I must I must confess. You haven't changed uh, I, the bit. I, I'm sorry? You haven't, haven't changed a bit. I haven't changed a bit. So, mm -hmm. so I, I purposely asked them, so what did you guys do um, in, in military security? I didn't expect an answer. And uh, he looks up. He looks at her. She looks <laughs> up, looks at him. And she answers me, we can't talk about that. Mm -hmm. Right. So, right. so, um, uh, so she's not altogether wrong in imagining what what they did and that it was important that, that she can't talk about it. <laughs> because when you ask, even when you're joshing them, uh, they took the question seriously, obviously, but um, right, right. but um, they can't talk about it. <laughs> right, right, for sure. I remember years ago, I was, uh, I, we have good friends down in the Washington DC area. Um, and uh, we went down for a simcha and we were staying for Shabbos and they put us up in a, in the home of, of a friend of theirs, a neighbor um, down there in, in that area. So, so I, I, we walk in, we introduce ourselves. Say, Hello, thank you for having us. Thank you. You know, sight unseen, this person, you know, was doing this as a favor for, for our mutual friend and I'm making chit chat. So I go, so I said, what do you do? What, 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 what's, what? And he goes, well, I work for national security. And then we didn't say another word for the rest of the Shabbos. That was it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it was, that was, well, we, that was the, the conversation stopper. Yeah. Well, I've I've read a, a couple of books, like uh, Valerie Plame's book, and uh, you know different things. And it's like 
her husband, like her husband knew she was doing something, but they couldn't talk about it. And I've read a few books where they, uh, uh, they've done things to get, uh, they've done things together, but they can, they can only talk about certain things. But you can imagine when um, uh, a president has all this uh, confidential stuff and classified stuff, he can't even talk to his wife about it. That's what so, keeps the marriage going. There's Absolutely. A, there's, a, there's a member of our, our congregation who, uh, who I would see in shul and, and be friendly with. And one day I asked him what he did and he was very evasive. So in my mind, he's a spook. <laughs> he could never talk about what he can well, do. I, I don't know if we're talking about the same person, David, but I know at one point he, he, he's not a member anymore. But we had a Navy SEAL who was a member of our shul. Yeah. And wow. um, after they got bin Laden, he, he was the one who spoke because as a SEAL. But he couldn't talk about what he did. And the Green Beret. Who yeah, probably yeah. can talk about what he did. Right. As a Green Beret? Are we, are then we're talking about the same person. No, okay. we're, we're talking about two different people. Two different people. Oh, okay. All right. We're going we're gonna to end it for today. Yes. So uh, I want to wish everybody a happy 2021. Yes. Definitely. And, and a healthy 2021. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Healthy, healthy, healthy. Yep. And uh, yes. good luck with everybody getting their vaccines in a timely uh, manner. And it's going uh, it's going to for us it's going to it's it's going to take it's going to take a while. Why well, right. advance because we're health, we're healthy. What Josie? No, but I'm, it goes by age also. We've moved yeah. up on I, this. I'm going to lie about my age. I'm going to say that I'm <laughs> over 21. So, okay. <laughs> but but I, I saw the list from Montclair so it's going to take a while. All right. Zygesint everybody. Zygesint. Zygesint.